Welcome back. So today we're going to talk about biochemistry. So whenever we're talking about biology and, and when we're going to take a basic biology class like uh, you're taking, you want to start with really the foundation. And the foundation is really talking about chemistry. So as much as we like to in any science or, or really in any, any uh, subject, we like to kind of separate things out. We like to talk about um, things based on different topics and different chapters. When we talk about biology, we like to break up biology into different chapters. And we talk about science, we like to take uh, break up science into different books, right? This is chemistry, this is physics, this is the earth sciences, this is biology. But really all of these sciences are intertwined. So the same thing goes for chemistry and biology. So really as much as we teach biology separate from chemistry, Chemistry has a lot to do with biology. So when we start talking about biology, we have to start at really the ground floor, the foundation, and that is chemistry, because chemistry is what makes up everything. So in chemistry, we're talking about different molecules. Okay, Everything is made up of molecules, and molecules are made up of atoms. So an atom is a bit of matter that cannot be subdivided any further without losing its essential properties. So when we're going to look at, a, at an atom and, and see that it is really the basic unit of chemistry. There are smaller units too, but once you remove those units from it, they really lose their properties. So an atom is that, that smallest form of, uh, of of matter that is going to have specific properties to it. And when we look at something that is made up of all the same uh, atoms, it's going to be called an element. So if you have, you know, there's a lot of things that are made up of different atoms. So if you look at something like water, well, water is H2O. It's made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Well, H2O being made up of two different things, that doesn't make it an element. But if we had hydrogen by itself or we had oxygen by itself, that would be considered an element. So something like gold, when you take gold, it pure gold, it is made up of all gold atoms. And that means that that is an element right there. Same thing goes for, uh, for copper. Or if we look at coal, it's all made up of, of one thing. So um, it, when we look at atoms, atoms have their own structure to it. So they are actually made up of these charged particles or these subunits to the atom. So the nucleus is composed of these two subunits called the protons and the neutrons. They are in the center. So when we look at an atom, right, this is a hydrogen atom that they're showing you, and this is a carbon atom that they're showing you, and different atoms have different amounts of these subunits. So you have protons. So in something like a hydrogen atom, it's going to have one proton, no neutrons here, and one electron. That is what makes it a hydrogen atom. Now, when we look at something like a carbon atom, it has a different amount of each, which makes it a carbon atom. So it has six protons, six neutrons, and it has six electrons on the outside. So the protons and the neutrons are in the inside, which we call the nucleus. And then outside, surrounding it are these negatively charged particles called electrons. And they are not tightly packed into a little nucleus. They're not tightly packed on the outside. They are kind of floating around in something that we call the electron cloud because it's like a cloud of these uh, negatively charged subunits or negatively charged uh, uh, particles that are moving around the nucleus. So when we look at something like a periodic table, the periodic table is a is really a, a way to organize all the different elements, to organize the different atoms that we can look at in different molecules, in different substances. And we organize this them into uh, um, different categories, and we also organize them based on their composition, their mass. So you're going to see in, in the periodic table each element is going to have an element symbol. So instead of writing out the full name, we, we assign it a symbol. So uh, oxygen is going to be O, hydrogen is H, carbon is C, and each one is going to be assigned a certain um, symbol to it. It also has an atomic number, which indicates, and we like to organize it by atomic number, but atomic number indicates the number of protons found in the nucleus. 
So that actually, as much as it, it's a good way to organize things, it, it also tells us how many protons are in the nucleus. So each element that we look at has a different number of protons, and that's how we can tell what type of, of element it is, what type of atom it is, and how to really um, uh, organize them. And then you have your element name, obviously, that they'll put on there, and the atomic mass. Okay, the atomic mass of an element is weighted by their abundance. Okay, um, so you see that the uh, the following colors are used throughout this book for elements commonly found in living organisms. So we, they in this book they do a nice thing for you where they color coat color coat the um, the uh, the different molecules or I'm sorry the different atoms that we're looking at so hydrogen is white in the book and carbon is going to be this gray color and so on and so forth so now there's also isotopes which are going to have the same amount of proton which makes it the same atom or the same element but it has more or fewer neutrons a different amount of neutrons so it's still in this example they show you carbon well it has the 12 protons which makes it carbon but has a different amount of neutrons than other carbon molecules so you can have one with 12 you could have um one with six neutrons one with seven neutrons one with eight neutrons and that's where we designate it with these different numbers so carbon 12 is going to have six neutrons carbon 13 will have seven carbon 14 but they're all carbon because they all contain the same amount of protons and atoms charge does not change um, so then we talk about atomic weight as well as radioactive atoms. So a few atomic nuclei are not stable and they break down spontaneously, meaning on their own. These atoms are considered radioactive. So during decomposition or, or um, breaking them down, they release at a constant rate a tiny high-speed particle carrying a lot of energy. So when we break them down, when they decompose, they are going to release energy. There are 25 elements in your body, and when we talk about um, elements on the Earth, uh, we can talk about numerous ones, some that you will never really come in contact with or you won't really hear about. But then there's ones that are constantly discussed and you're constantly going to hear about because not only are they always in our environment, but they really make us up. So the big four you're always going to hear about, specifically when we're talking about living things or, or really humans more specifically, is oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen and the biggest one that creates life is carbon you need to have carbon in order to have life so in any living things they're going to have carbon they're going to have molecules that have carbon in them and they're also going to have oxygen they're going to have hydrogen and they're going to have nitrogen as well so just 10 elements make up 99.9% .9 of your body Four of these, which are the oxygen, the carbon, the hydrogen, and the nitrogen, are most abundant and make up about 96% of your body. So you see, this makes up about 96%, and then you have these other ones making up about 4%, and then there's a, a small, a very tiny amount, 0.1% of elements that, uh, it's 15 other elements that also contribute to the composition of the body. So everything around us living or not is made up from at atoms the smallest unit into which material can be divided without losing its properties remember there are smaller components than the atom but with but they lose their properties so the smallest unit we can get by maintaining some type of properties to it is going to be the atom and atoms all have the same general structure to them they're all going to have that that uh, the protein and the, and the neutrons together uh, with the electrons on the outside in the electron cloud. So they're made up of protons, neutrons, along with the electrons. And with the electron shell or electron cloud, that's going to determine bonding patterns. So there's different ways that these atoms come together in order to make larger molecules. So while um, the, the atoms have their own properties to, to them, they do come together in certain ways, which makes larger molecules and, and larger molecules come together in certain ways. So you have this electron shell or this electron cloud where these negatively charged particles are constantly surrounding and, and, and revolving around the, 
the uh, the nucleus. And as they're doing this, they have a certain way of trying to find other electrons in order to make them more stable. They are, have a a uh, a kind of affinity or a want to be more stable, to be locked into a molecule that is not really uneven with the amount of, of electrons that are in its cloud. So um, you have uh, atomic stability that we're talking about. Atoms become stable when their outermost shell is filled to capacity. So what these elements are doing, what these atoms are doing is they're trying to fill their outer shell. So you have something like hydrogen, okay? The outer shell of hydrogen should have two. Okay, so there should be one electron here, one electron here is what they're saying. Well, what does it want to do? Well, it wants to be able to find something to fill that shell. You have something like nitrogen, okay? It has, it needs to have eight on the outside. It has five. It's looking for three more to make it more stable, okay? Opposed to looking at something like helium, which has two on the outside, or something like neon, which has the eight on the outside. So only when atoms have electron vacancies in their outermost shell are they likely to interact with other atoms. So when you have ones that have these openings or these vacancies in their shell, they're constantly looking for, uh, for other electrons to come into their shell to make them more stable. So something like carbon is very versatile because it has four openings to it, four vacancies. So the outside, we want it to be eight. And it has four electrons, but it needs four more. So there's a huge variety of complex molecules that are possible. All right, you can get, uh, you can add uh, a molecule that has two, two of the molecule, two, two of a molecule that has two to add to it. Uh, you can add uh, four ones. You you can add uh, one four. There's so many different ways to, or different combos to kind of come together and create the eight on the outside. So carbon mostly bonds with oxygen hydrogen, nitrogen, as well as other carbon molecules because that is they are able to fill that void, fill the, the those openings to the electron the uh, the electron cloud. So ions are actually charged atoms. You talk, you hear about ions a lot of times they might be interchanged with molecules. All right, they are charged molecules. So um, an atom that loses one or more electron becomes positively charged. So since you have these negatively charged particles, if you're going to remove one negatively charged particle, it suddenly becomes more positive. While an atom that gets one, so this one is a certain way, and then we're adding more negative molecules to it, it becomes negatively charged. And this is what creates ions. So you have uh, something here where this is going to be a sodium ion, which becomes positively charged, sometimes written as Na+, plus because Na is the symbol for sodium, and plus is saying, hey, it's a positively charged ion. Where, on the other hand, you have chloride, a chloride ion where it is getting an extra, and it would be Cl, which is chlorine, minus. It is a negatively charged ion of chlorine. So the chemical characteristics of an atom depend on the number of electrons in its outermost shell. The the characteristic of it wanting to bond with other uh, um, atoms is really based on how many electrons are in its outermost shell. So atoms are most stable and least likely to bond with other atoms once that outermost electron shell is going to be filled to capacity. Once those openings or those vacancies are going to be filled, it's going to be less, uh, it's going to be more stable and less reactive and less um, willing to bond with other elements. So molecules are groups of atoms. Okay, so not everything just stays an atom. You're not. It's not like um, uh, hydrogen is just going to stay pure hydrogen. No, hydrogen wants to bond with other things, and it's going to create a what we call a molecule. So when you take different atoms and you put them together, that creates a molecule. Now bond energy is really dependent upon the atoms involved. And whenever we look at chemical reactions, we're always going to look at it from two different sides. You're going to have the reactants. And then you're going to have the products. The reactants are the things that are trying to come together or, or what happens in the beginning. And the products are what is the end result. So the start is the reactants. And the end is the products. 
So there's different ways to represent molecular structure, and you'll see in different textbooks they like to do it differently. A lot of times you'll see that they like to use this Lewis model. It kind of keeps it simple. But you can also use this ball and stick model, which is, is kind of pretty to look at. And sometimes they like to use this space filling model. But I see a lot of times that they just use this Lewis model. But all of them are really depicting the same thing. All right, this is trying to depict the same thing as this is trying to depict and this is trying to depict. So there's different types of bonds that occur in chemistry, all right? And there's there's many different ones, but there's there's ones that we like to focus on the most and covalent bonds is one of them. And this is where we see that two atoms are going to share electrons, okay? They're going to share. So something like a hydrogen atom Hydrogen wants to fill that void. Well, this hydrogen also wants to fill that void. So what do they do? Well, now they can share the one that they each have, and now they each have two, and that creates a covalent bond. And now instead of having just hydrogen atom, you have an H2 molecule. And uh, the sing we call this a single covalent bond. We also have double covalent bonds as well. So then you have ionic bonds, which instead of sharing it, all right, you have two oppositely charged ions, which are going to attract each other. And now it becomes neutral by doing so. All right. So something like sodium, right, it wants it, it's going to um, uh, uh, give this to transfer its one of its electrons completely to the, the uh, chloride ion. And now you see that uh, the two are oppositely charged ions, and they um, attract each other because now you're creating that positive and that negative, and those and those opposites are going to attract. So by it donating one, by the sodium donating one to the chloride, it's going to uh, create that that it's going to fill that void, and it's going to uh, create that that uh, kind of magnetic effect where you have a, a positive and a negative and the opposites are attracting and now that sodium and that chloride become, become sodium chloride or table salt. And then we also have, which is very important, we see this a lot in when we talk about um, humans and we talk about genetics and DNA, is hydrogen bonds. And they bond molecules together as well. So they're going to form between slightly positive hydrogen atoms in one molecule and a slightly negative atom in other molecules. And the result, the, the resulting bond is weaker than covalent or ionic bond. And where this is important is when we want to easily break these bonds. So in DNA, we're going to talk about later in the semester, in DNA, we want to have a weak bond. So in DNA, we want a weak bond so that we are able to break it break the DNA up so that we can make copies of it and then put it back together very easily. So that's where hydrogen bonds are very useful. So like we said, we're going, we have these different types of bonds that we like to look at, ionic bonds, covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds. And what you really need to know is that covalent bonds are going to be from sharing electrons. Your ionic bonds are going to be from the transfer of electrons. And then you have these hydrogen bonds, which are weaker than covalent formed from the attraction between a hydrogen atom and another atom with a slightly negative charge. So you, you have this positively, positive, positively charged hydrogen atom, and it's going to then bond with a slightly negatively charged of some other atom. Okay, So hydrogen bonds make water cohesive. Okay, That creates this bond where water kind of sticks to other water molecules. And that's where we see things like surface te tension. So if you ever see um, uh, certain organisms kind of standing on top of water, something like this spider, um, that's because there is a lot of surface tension. Once you break that surface tension, then things are able to sink. But it, by, them, by those water molecules wanting to kind of stick together, it creates that surface tension. And that's why you see that um, when you look at something in like a beaker, it kind of has a, a, it looks like the water is kind of bent a little bit. Well, that's because the water is sticking to each other and making it seem at, as though it is rising up. It is not rising up. It is just kind of sticking together to each other and is able to create that, that area of that surface tension. So, Lastly, you know, water molecules easily form these hydrogen bonds, giving water great cohesiveness. And also we see this in DNA. 
which is helpful in DNA replication, as well as transcription and translation, which we'll talk about more as we move forward, but just some things to think about. So keep these things in mind as we move forward. You want to understand how these are really the building blocks of everything that there is on Earth.